Okay, uh, let's get get started. Uh, it's an honor to have uh, Charlie Colstead here. Um, Charlie is is one of the leading figures uh, in environmental economics. He was right after what I would call the founding fathers in really pushing forward this agenda of, uh, of environmental economics as separate from resource economics. And uh, this has a this talk today, as you'll have read already, uh, is very policy applicable. Um, and Charlie, for just a little bit of background, I met Charlie when we were colleagues in Illinois, and I can't, I don't know, Charlie can fill in where he was before Illinois, but we overlapped there for quite a few years, and then he uh, went to Santa Barbara, and uh, Past five years, he's been at um, Stanford, um, so he's been sort of gravitating west where some of us like the heart uh, So, Charlie, without further ado, you have your five minutes. Okay. Yes. So, well, at least correct. I, I did. Uh, we did meet there at, at Illinois, and I think we're the only two faculty members that decided to live out in the countryside <laughs> uh, and commute into. To, in the middle of January when the freezing rain was coming down. Um, but you all know about that here. And it's actually quite a pleasure to get back to what looks a lot like Ur Urbana uh, in Bloomington, even though it's, uh, it's probably a nicer town than Urbana. Um, but uh, anyway, it's a pleasure to be back here. Um, I was in New Mexico before. Really. New Mexico. Um, so, so I... This is this is work at a, a early stage, which uh, I understand is actually what you want at this this seminar. So that's I don't have to apologize for it. Um, it's it's early. This is the this is the first time I've presented it as a paper. I, I have talked about some of the issues before. But let me just spend five minutes or so just just to setting the stage. Um, there there are lots and lots of local effects of efforts at greenhouse gas regulations. You know it from reading the uh, newspaper. You know, California, it seems many states are, are trying to do something. Um, lots of little countries around the world are doing things. And uh, they're all sort of trying to grapple with the, the, the competing goals of being effective. In other words, not just window dressing, they actually are trying to reduce greenhouse gases but also uh, palatable locally. In other words, you don't want to kill jobs, local economy, tax revenue, all the things that matter to, to localities, and a locality can be big or little, um, but those two things are acting at cross purposes. If you increase costs for firms by getting them to do other things to reduce their emissions, then you're putting them at a competitive disadvantage. So to, trying to deal with this uh, it's really a theme of this paper. Right? You know, an alternate title could be, could have been having your cake and eating it too, because that's really what people are trying to do. Um, it's a, it's the real policy problem faced by the, the Waxman Markey bill, which was the bill in 2010 that President Obama got through the House of Representatives, but it failed in the Senate. This was a cap and trade on carbon. AB 32, that's the California law, which, which we know well, but of course not everybody knows what's going on in California as much as us Californians like to think they do. Um, and there's the EU uh, EPS, the European Union's Emissions Trading System, which has many of the same issues. You read, you, you read the discussions of it. Uh, so the, the, basic, the basic challenges are to define um, trade exposure this is really the nub. Industries that have to compete with extraterritorial uh, producers. Now, the, it doesn't have to be a foreign producer. You know, Indiana could be competing with Illinois. That's just the same as Indiana competing with uh, France. Um, but defining trade exposure in a quantitative way, because it's 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 a fuzzy concept. 
fuzzy concept. Really, it's it's related to relevant markets that you've run into and in, in, uh, in I trust. It's it's the extent to which you can raise your costs due to regulation of a, of a dom domestic firm and uh, not be really killed by competitors in response to that increased cost so you can pass on some of the cost. So how to define this in, in a way that's, that's a, uh, not just binary, so, uh, industries trade exposed or not trade exposed, but in some more continuous fashion so that you can integrate it then with a uh, level of an environmental regulation. And then secondly, at least the, the, the regulations that have been put forward have also looked at energy intensity as an important issue. But it's not clear to me that matters if you, if you handle the trade intensity properly. And then how to adjust your incentives to account for these things. So the structure of the paper is there's some motivating examples, a theoretical model, um, and uh, I guess we'll discuss those things. Where next, what's not done, what are the unanswered questions? Um, well, when we, we get into it, uh, the, the, a better de budget constraint between the emissions tax revenue and the output subsidies, which is a detail in the paper. Uh, the quantitative coupling of the trade exposure with the output subsidy. And uh, ultimately, the goal is to come up with some results that have practical import for regulators where they can say, you know, sort of like the Ramsey rule for, for pricing uh, railroads, uh, pra practical import that can be implemented and make, it, make a difference in how, we, how small economies, uh, open economies, regulate uh, emissions. That's that's my little bit over five minutes. Great, succinct. Floor. First question. So, uh, very obviously, a really interesting topic, and it raises all kinds of questions. I wanted to address it at a kind of a, a, a larger policy uh, issue to start, uh, and and. Um, the, the obvious concern here is, like, if we make our, if we make manufacturing more or production uh, more expensive, we're going to be hurt on the international market. Uh, but doesn't that? Why? Why the focus? This comes in two parts. Why the focus on carbon, and not on labor, not on capital, not on other inputs? And second, if if you sort of arrive at this conclusion that carbon is just another input to the production process. Uh, what if you were to go for a revenue neutral um, uh, price here? So you say, look, yeah, we're going to increase the cost of energy use by putting a carbon tax on this, but we're going to reduce the cost of labor or capital or some other input to production. And, uh, you know, uh, we'll be more competitive because of that. Um, and, and is there some hope for balancing those two? Well, I, there are a number of questions there. So if I if I miss some of you, some of you, you can come come back. Um, but you know why carbon and not labor or capital? Well, well, that's 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 a good question. You could uh, uh, conceivably want to use this framework to look at capital and labor taxation, although people have looked at that and uh, um, there's, there's a lot is known about that. The problem here is that there's an externality from the carbon that's, caught, that's a problem that needs correcting and you don't find that, at least not at the first, at the first level with labor and capital. No, no obvious, obviously the reason you're doing the carbon tax is to address the externality. Right, and, and, and what I'm getting at is if you're worried about the trade implications, make it revenue neutral yeah, that, and reduce just, the cost of other input. Tax, that's, tax, that's, the one that stood it right, is tax, tax the carbon, but then rather that you were vague on the output subsidy, um, why not subsidize, I think Ken's point is, why not subsidize the capital or the labor on no, the input I, side rather than the output side? I, I, that, part, that part of the question, I think, 
revenue neutral carbon tax, of course, is um, probably the number one new regulation that's possible in the next uh, uh, administration. And, but the, 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 the difference is, is that uh, even though the, the, the money from the carbon tax is staying within a jurisdiction, the marginal incentives are, are, are still carbon intensive firms will be hit hard and the fact that somebody else in the state is, is, re, is gets that revenue doesn't help that firm that's getting that's getting a, a big hit on carbon taxes it's going to cause put it at a competitive disadvantage and uh, maybe eventually everything will sort out and only green uh, industries will remain, and the brown industries have gone elsewhere. But that's precisely the kind of thing that that, that transition phase, precisely what politicians are, don't want to see. They don't want to see the carbon tax responsible for uh, firms uh, losing competitive position, losing jobs. They don't care if, in fact, state is just as well off and other industries are prospering as a result. Um, so just because just because labor intensive industries do better doesn't yeah. get rid of the fact that the carbon intensive industries don't. I mean, you know, carriers leaving half of carriers leaving Indianapolis and that gets the news, not the fact that whatever else is happening One thing you don't talk about at all is uh, things like geoengineering or, or research uh, inputs, which are more feasible maybe for a smaller organization, or just the research into something like um, the, the pipeline flying to the sky, if you know that one, um, seeding to try to cool the atmosphere. Those are expensive, but in the scale of California, they are something that actually pipeline. make a difference. I don't know about the pipeline to the sky. Oh, that is um, one where you'd have a basically a hose to the sky um, that would shoot out sulfur from the upper atmosphere that would provide a nucleus for vapor or something, oh, block okay. sunlight, Clubs. and be a, a, a pseudo-volcano. So yeah, I, I've heard there. about airplanes going up there to do that. It's cloud whitening. You can salt it, too. Yeah, various kinds of things. I think there's a lot of sulfur from uh, shale oil or something. Yeah, that's a pretty long hose. <laughs> but there's a lot of imaginative ways. That's, that's where research money could actually do something. And of course, those have the option value that it turns out the global warming is really stopping, then you don't have to actually go to the implementation stage. Yeah, you know, uh, I don't talk about those um, because what, what, you know, what, one of the, well, for several reasons, what, one of the perplexing dimensions of this problem with carbon is that it's not really individually rational for a small economy to regulate carbon on its own. That's, you know, the, the impact on damage is negligible from what you, what a, even a some place like California, which is our biggest state, uh, the, 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 they can't justify it based on the reduction in the damage from climate. And that's really what geoengineering is uh, oriented to, to, to do. It has to be a much more complicated, in fact, it's very, very much of a governance issue. The big, the big reason is that they, they want to uh, show that this can be done, and hopefully other, other states and places will follow suit. So it's a, it's a, it's a leader, leadership in the, in the governance and climate. Um, but uh, uh, it, it, the, the, the real motivation, I want to get back to, back to the, Ken's question as well as address this geoengineering one, is, is, is in, in California, uh, I was talking to the head of the Air Resources Board who's in charge of the carbon regulation, and she said, you know, we've had so much pushback, people believing that if the bureaucracy of the state gets a hold of this issue, they're just going to kill the economy, just like they did with the electricity crisis of 
the year 2000, where the efforts at deregulating electricity basically caused the, everything to blow up, uh, at least economically, for, for a while. And she said, you know, we really just want to show that we can reduce carbon emissions without screwing things up. <laughs> and that's, that's really, uh, and she profoundly felt that. She said, that's what Governor Brown has been telling me to do. And uh, I'm not sure that they feel that quite as strongly in other places like uh, in Washington or Brussels. But uh, I, 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 that's really the point I'm trying to address. Now, the geoengineering is something that has a lot of problems associated with it and a lot of advantages. One is that the, the public goods dimensions of it and the uh, free riding dimensions are gone from Geoengineering. If you want a, if you want palm trees in Bloomington, you can just send a rocket up in the, uh, into space and put some sulfur up there. And the costs are such that it can be individually rational for an individual state to do that. Maybe not a state of the U.S., but a, but a, certainly Russia or an, uh, an Arctic state. Good. The economics are such that it makes it. Uh, you don't have to get international cooperation to do the geoengineering. That's just a real totally different kettle of fish. Dean? Yeah, I want to follow up with your mission that you know, states are not rational when they try to implement some carbon policy. Um, because you have this model that's sort of assuming the state is rational. Um, and the political economy can't can't be the one that's implied by that model that's generating these policies. There's uh, got to be sectors that are carbon intense and sectors that are not carbon intense. There's got to be environmental groups and so forth that generate the kind of policy that California has or British Columbia has and so forth. We saw the recent uh, uh, problems in Washington where the revenue neutral carbon tax even went down. Um, so I'm trying to think what this, this model is not, it's not a positive description of like California or any other. So, you know, what um, what are the lessons we can draw from it, I guess? Well, you're, 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 you're right, and, and certainly at one level. Um, and that, I, I value you know, the inputs from, from here today. Um, the model as it's set up as there's damage from the carbon that, it, that is occurs domestically. And uh, if you take it at its word, uh, a, a small economy is going to have small damages, which means it's going to do hardly anything to control the pollution. If you think of it as a large damage, then that's actually not uh, factually correct. So the, the, that's, that's a very good point. There is, there is something uh, missing. Let me, let me suggest something you might might do, we, um, a lot of, and I think you mentioned it uh, or implied it in your, your, your opening remarks, but um, a lot of local countries are undertaking adaptation policies. Small country, I mean, uh, Netherlands, for example, is building their wall a little higher and so forth. I don't know what California does on this dimension, but that's that's something that they probably are doing at some level, and that could be, I mean, I could imagine a model where California is trading off some emissions mitigation policy against some local adaptation. And that might be a richer um, positive model than, than what you have sort of set up here at the moment. And then I don't know the data on that at all that they're up to, but that's a, you know that's a good suggestion. I think I think I think there actually there's there's that and I'll come, come back to that. There's also uh, what we do in the US, you know, the we have the social cost of carbon which many of you are familiar with. Um, it's an effort to quantify the damage uh, from an additional ton of carbon made in the cost of uh, abatement aside. And uh, one of the controversy, controversial parts of that is that the damage that's in there is not just damage to the U.S., but it's damage elsewhere. And in fact, of uh, the $40 <coughs> social cost of carbon, perhaps $2 is damage to the U.S., 
and $38 is damage to other countries. Um, <coughs> Accepted, but the justification is that we really should be taking our policies, to, uh, 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 we should be pursuing policies that are uh, efficient. If we want other countries to follow suit, we should be leading the way, doing what we'd like them to do. Uh, but, but nevertheless, it's, um, it's adding on the foreign damage to the domestic damage. Now, if you took this model and included the damage that's occurring overseas or at the margin, the changes in damage overseas from policies within the state, that could have, that could generate a more realistic um, uh, political, it's not really a political economy model, but it, it, could, it could achieve a little bit of closure, logical closure uh, on the model. Uh, the, the suggestion you made regarding adaptation, I think, is a, uh, it's a really interesting one. California is doing that, but not in the way you'd think. Jerry Brown, the governor, has this uh, pet project of the high-speed rail from San Diego to San Francisco. Very expensive. Um, people, some people are really enthusiastic, others are not. And the uh, revenue from the carbon tax is being earmarked for the high-speed rail uh, in large part. And the, the justification is that, you know, as the climate changes, we're going to need to have a, uh, a robust transportation within the state. And I think, I think there's, a, there's a problem of uh, uh, that all of the, and we see it all, all over the place in the West, all of the uh, interest groups that have, uh, that, see, that see benefits from this pot of money being generated are trying to lay claim on it, and uh, adaptation is one of the main reasons that they use for laying claim on it, sometimes with a real, real stretch. So you're right, but I'm not sure that would, that would help the, um, the analysis too well. So only the Dutch are doing real adaptation. With the Dutch. <laughs> I heard Japan is too... Well, flooding is flooding is a, is a big issue in the state. Although it's inland flooding, it's the Sacramento River. Yeah. Uh, many of you know that California's got these cliffs along the coast, and the sea level rises. And you don't actually lose a whole lot of land very quickly, except where these fingers go in the end. Like the, uh, the, the Sac Sacramento was way inland, but it's 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 on a master bay. Uh, saltwater estuary, and that's where the flooding would occur. Just yes. anyway. Um, yeah, so I I really enjoyed this. It's not an area where I um, have uh, read a whole lot, and so I really, really enjoyed it. I have a, a, just a, maybe a specific question that leads to a broader question. Um, when, you, when you model the combination of the emission tax with the output subsidy, Early on, you, sort, you say that um, the firm does not see the connection between the emissions tax and the later rebate. Um, and you make another assumption about sort of the, um, all of the emission fees is, is rebated and that, you know, you could sort of relax the, the budgetary constraint. But I was wondering about this first assumption, about why it is that you are comfortable making, I mean, is, is that sort of part of what I'm not familiar with, or is that a common assumption that's made, but why would firms not make that connection? And um, if they, um, and if, if that's, a, that's a sort of standard assumption to make, I'd be really curious to know what your thoughts are as to if they were actually able to make the connection, sort of to act accordingly by recognizing that the, um, that the emissions tax would later be rebated, um, how would that change the sort of dynamics of the model? Would that shift the outcomes at all? That's, that's, a, that's a great question, and uh, it's, a, it, it's, it's one that uh, I, mean, I, did, I certainly understand the, the reasons for it, and actually people do ask that question. Uh, it, it, 
the way the model is set up, it's uh, it's 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 viewed as as one firm or an industry, but really in actuality, it's lots lots of firms, and the behavior of any one firm uh, regarding the emissions actions. Let's say we have a small firm that's facing the emission fee, so they see if they adjust their emission fee, uh, their the payments to the to the state will change, uh, but their their output subsidy is coming from the big old pot, and it's not going to be directly coupled to what they do on their emissions level. So so they don't see a strategic advantage of changing their emissions level so they get more or less the output subsidy. They're sort of disconnected from one another. So even though the, the, that in terms of the analysis, that's sort of swept under the rug by treating one firm, that's that's in fact the, it, the actuality of it. It's the same applies to the demand curve for the goods. Uh, you know, why doesn't the firm see a slope to the demand curve? It's because it's, it's an industry demand curve and It's, it's the same kind of thing. But it's a good question. It's, it's what we're going to face if we have a revenue neutral carbon tax in, in the U.S. You know, how do we give it back to people, of, of firms, well, firms or people? Who's it going to go back to? That, that'll be one issue. And how do you do it in such a way that you don't destroy the incentive properties of the uh, emission tax? Well, a lot of people big wide world, not in here, don't don't understand the, the purpose of an emission tax. They, they don't see it as an incentive device. They see it as more of a money raising thing. Uh, they don't quite understand it as an incentive. And uh, it's, it's, that's obviously its only function, really, particularly in a revenue neutral context. This, this follows up on, on Jess's point. Um, so if we look at Waxman Markey and you look at those big circles and and you look at who's producing emissions. Like the diagram in the paper? Yeah, and who's doing the who's doing the trading. When we think of this in the real world, uh, you'd say, okay, well, you don't have to worry about lime production because it's not a tradable good. Um, but you do really need to worry about them a lot because their emissions are really bad. So you want to want to tax on them, but you don't really want to, you know, it, uh, it gets complicated. You also care what you rightly do in this paper, which is nice, about domestic trade as well. But if we're just thinking about international trade, um, but everything lime can just move to the next state. Um, but the the issue is is twofold. One is that it certainly won't be revenue neutral across industries um, if we want to take that diagram seriously of who you should be subsidizing uh, either their inputs or their outputs. Um, and I was thinking of it further on on the, on the tax and rebate side that uh, this, it's, it's constitutionality in terms of uh, what law folks call singling out, so that you'd be singling out lime to subsidize, let's say, nitrogen, which is a heavily tradable good in one of those markets. So the it's leaving aside the constitutional uh, uh, issue of, of taxing uh, and singling out, uh, it seems to me you'd have such a mess politically, um, and, and so it's, it's how, I'm trying to think of how, what other side payments you could use, because the logic is, is, for economists, the logic is clear what you want to do, but then you're, in some sense, taxing, disproportionately taxing lime to subsidize nitrogen production um, because of the employment effects. And, you know, adaptation doesn't really get you there. Geo doesn't really get you there because these are cross-industry and cross-firm taxes and subsidies. So there's the political economy issue, but, but I'm trying to think of the, 
also the economic issue of what, how one could mitigate that. Well, you know, I, I, I think that that's that's where that's where politicians and and people that are smarter than I really have an advantage in in, in crafting something that looks very intuitive that really is in fact uh, a disguised version of, of what you're saying. And I, I, what, one example is the is the output based. Um, allocation of marketable permits. So mm -hmm. you, you have a marketable permit system. That's, this is a permit for emissions. Right. And uh, ideally, you should auction these off to folks. Right. Um, but pe people have decided, well, if, if we differentially auction these off, by, or if we give a, a certain proportion of the allowances to different industries based on their uh, trade exposure, it's a uh, it's a very intuitive way to do it. You know, this 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 industry is very susceptible to Chinese or Nevada competition or Illinois competition, so we're we're only going to make them buy half the permits they need. Um, in this other industry, maybe the lime industry, we're going to make them buy all their permits. Well, really, what you're doing is you're giving them an output. Least a subsidy, uh, but you're doing it in a, in a way that's much more intuitive for a, a non-economist or just a just a just a regular regular person. It's very very um, uh, politically attractive because the industries that are hurt the most from trade uh, get treated better, and get get more free stuff. Right. So, uh, and I think what what's needed is is versions of that for for some of these other issues. I mean, well, but one, I mean, one could think about it. Just flipping this, one could think about this. Basically, it comes down to the elasticity of these demand curves, right? Yeah. So, so that you take the extreme case that and, and supply from foreign supply. E exactly. So that if you've got a completely inelastic demand for or lime, then it doesn't matter to the you know, limit, it doesn't matter to the lime industry because the whole cost would be borne by consumers. Consumers are made worse off. If, uh, if the residual demand is, yeah. uh, is <coughs> elastic, absolutely exactly. correct. That's what I meant. So, so that, but at least playing around with, you know, you don't want to go to congressional he hearing and talk about elasticities and residual demands, but. Um, that's basically so the consumer doesn't enter into that's exactly it, right, but the consumer does enter into this because of the cost structure that they'll be paying higher prices for the goods that they consume that have these carbon taxes and fewer of these output subsidies. And we may think that's fine, uh, but it, those are the welfare. And it does have those employment effects. So we got Michael and Gustavo and Eric. Unless we're right on this point. Um, well, kind of actually, I guess. <laughs> you're jumping. <laughs> okay. No, I think one of the main uh, points your papers make to policymakers is that you should have the output subsidies or equivalently tax cuts on everything else, which I think is what you're really thinking about. Because otherwise, um, what you're really having is an expansion of the tax system and of government, which is discouraging production. And it isn't carbon policy per se. So um, in, in your model with the output subsidies, it's the carbon policy in the end that's doing it. That's a much smaller effect than if you just increase taxes uh, in general. Hmm. So uh, um, maybe I'm, I'm missing something here. So you're, you're saying that uh, the, the carbon policy is Increase in taxes, or if I misunderstand. Yeah, so suppose we just had increased in the income tax, and that would reduce output. So we've increased in the carbon tax, well, that's going to reduce output too, but yeah. it's not especially because it's a carbon tax, it's because it's a tax. So if policymakers want to um, really want to show that environmental policy doesn't necessarily hurt the state, then they should separate it out from tax policy, from tax, increasing tax revenue. <clears throat> I see. So that, that, your argument is that. Uh, should be revenue neutral uh, to, to neutralize that that particular effect, and then look at the effect on uh, on output. That's right. That's right. Sort of fair, and then have a labor income tax increase generally if that's the secondary objective. 
Now, of course, politically, they're trying to hide the tax increase into an environmental policy. But that's kind of the opposite of what, of what you're saying the objectives are here, which is to minimize the amount of environmental policy. Yeah, that, 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 that's a good point. I mean, that, in my partial equilibrium setup here, that's, that's really the purpose of the <coughs> output, taking all of the tax revenue and, and rebating it in the form of an output subsidy. Mm -hmm. And that, that's isolating the effect. Yeah, that, that's a much better way of looking at it. Canada did that on, uh, I'm trying to remember which tax it did, but it had an offsetting tax decrease. So it, it was... This is British Columbia carbon tax you're talking about? Yeah. And, and so they then reduced, I think it was the provincial tax it was, yeah. that they reduced so that they, it was clear you were, you were taxing <coughs> cared about energy and you care about environment and but nevertheless we want to keep citizens tax neutral uh, and and it it may have some good political economy features for, for selling it I, I, which is I think Eric's that's point. exactly what we lost in Washington what the policy that said we'll have a carbon tax and we'll cut uh, income taxes and other taxes sales tax and that lost, that just lost First, it was basically designed on the British Columbia tax and lost. You know, humane in the past administration. No, just now, just three weeks ago. Yeah. Washington State. State of Washington. Oh, Washington State. Yeah. Right, right, right. Oh, Washington State? Yes. Yeah. So that's, that, not, I that's, a, that's oh, a whole other additional <laughs> discussion. <laughs> in, 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 in British Columbia, the interesting thing is that they maintained the carbon neutrality right. for the first few years. Yeah. And then at some point, the politicians just couldn't help themselves. They were just looking at this going, holy crap, that's a lot of money. Let's attract the Hollywood industry. Yeah, Let's right. attract this thing and that thing. And they just couldn't resist dipping into it. Well, you know, this is a really tough political, it's a political <clears throat> economy issue. I've, I don't know how many times that I've, I've faced this where people say, well, you know, we're, we're generating all this revenue from the carbon tax. What's wrong with using it for things related to reduce carbon? You know, all, all the, the, the if you open that floodgate, there's no no end to the projects that reduce carbon. It's a, it's a very it's a very difficult argument to uh, explain to a layperson. Interestingly, in California, you may be required to do that because uh, I'm trying to remember the number of the proposition, but the one that basically says if you raise revenue, yeah, or you need to use it. You need to use that revenue for something related to the thing you raised it from. It may be that they, if it's if it's a tax, it needs a supermajority. But if you can make it a user fee, which is sort of like what you're describing, then it's uh, just a simple majority. I don't know. Although California now has a supermajority of Democrats in all houses, so we'll see what happens. Michael? Yeah, uh, so you have a model here with one good and all that, and you put a tax on output, and um, and there is foreign trade in California, it cannot impose tariffs and all that. But what is wrong with simply, with simply taxing the goods, either inputs or outputs, yeah. or both, but depending on their presumed sort of carbon um, yeah. content. It's sort of similar, I guess, to energy efficiency, except uh, it doesn't have to be equivalent. And then basically it doesn't matter if it's a foreign good or, or domestically produced good. Uh, and that way I don't see why there would be any leakage, right? Well... That's, a, that's an interesting point. So basically you're saying uh, the tariff wouldn't just apply to imports of tires. Yeah. It would apply yeah. to all sales of tires. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I suspect that that would um, be theoretically correct. Well, you know, one of the problems with countervailing tariffs, tariffs on imports for carbon purposes is you don't know the carbon content of them. You also run into the problem with GATT of uh, uh, basically discriminating based on the means of production overseas. No, no, no. The it more being 
I'm more pressed by like seeing tires, right? Yeah, but you, but it's it's not just the carbon that's in the tires that show up. It's the carbon that was was generated in manufacturing the tires that you don't see, and uh, you know you don't know how much carbon was used. That's true. No, no. Of course, it's a very it's a very crude uh, crude mechanism. But so my point is, California is free to tax any goods. That are sold in California, right? Uh, as long yes, as it does not discriminate. Right. So, well. So you're saying this would be instead of a carbon tax? Well, it could be. It could be in addition. It could be split. Uh, but that wouldn't take care of the, the the problem with the trade. No, to the extent that there is a carbon tax, it would be a problem with leakage. But I am so, saying it can be mitigated if you if you impose taxes on goods that presumably generate a lot of carbon. Whether they are made in California or outside of California, it doesn't matter. Okay, so, so, so let me, let me just uh, follow us through. So you're, you're going to, that you're going to pass a law that says all goods sold in California shall be taxed based on the amount of carbon that was taken to produce them. And if the good was produced in China, you're going to assume the uh, manufacturing process is the same as in the U.S.? Well, yes, I agree. It's a very crude yeah. device. It's not the point. The point is that you would it. mitigate leakage because basically you can, use, you can use a carbon tax in California at some relatively low level, all right, because usually for two instruments are better than one. All right, and then you could impose a tax, all right, on the on the sort of assumed it could be it could be assumed at efficient level, it could be assumed at inefficient level. <clears throat> it's just I'm saying it would not solve the problem; it would mitigate it. No, that's that. I mean, I think that's a, a slightly different problem because then all of the exports from California. Uh, would, have, would, have, yes. would not be taxed. Yes. So much of the production in California wouldn't necessarily Except be taxed. Except exports, of course, do not have to to be taxed, right? That's a different issue. It's a political economy issue to some extent. So if you think about VAT, all right, under VAT exports are not taxed, right? Right. So it can it can have it can have the same the same sort of mechanism. What about the um, Metaphor, but the, the big iPhone factory in Silicon Valley that's churning out smoke and iPhones that are going out all over the world, uh, we have no ability to uh, to control that uh, that emissions. All right, again, just as on just as on the robot, if your issue is export, it's possible to have a system of rebates. Every country. Essentially, it does. They wouldn't address the carbon generation in the state. Why? Because most of those iPhones are not being sold in the okay. state of US yeah, yeah. California. Yes, all right. So that's, so that's why I'm saying it's possible to use both. It's just a lower rate carbon tax to provide. Yeah, that's a, that's a real interesting yeah. idea. Yeah. And I think, I think it's uh, certainly something to, to explore. I think, I think it's, it's, Possible, it's a slightly different uh, issue, uh, but it's it's certainly a, a valid one. It's probably closer to first best than the approach that's uh, presented here. Maybe. <laughs> so on this point, that, that maybe if the issue are the exports essentially, then maybe you can apply the same logic with that we are applying to trade agreements, no? Maybe essentially the other countries now they have incentives to tax those iPhones in their countries, so they are imports imports for them. So maybe the same type of stuff. The way we are solving a, a terms of trade externality with the trade agreement is essentially we try to avoid <coughs> that I try to manipulate my the terms of trade with the tariff, and their countries doing the same thing, and we come we end up in a Nash equilibrium that is worse than reducing both the tariff. You know, well. This looks still looking like pretty similar, no? Yeah. So essentially, I will tax, uh, let's say, iPhones for the 
extra marginal cost that the marginal damages are producing, and let's you know, China will do the same with the with the iPhones that we are exporting to China, you know? and that could be perfectly. Uh, we see that the burden in general, and we all have incentive, and it could be individually rationally for both to implement that those those uh, those uh, taxes. No? You know, I, I suspect that's a more complicated way of of, uh, of skinning the cat, so to speak. I see. Because uh, <coughs> if Malaysia is going to tax the iPhones based on the carbon emissions in California when they were manufactured, I know they're made in China, but metaphors that are made in California. Uh, that's much more difficult than uh, taxing or regulating the emissions where they're generated. Because you don't know what the, the emissions were. And if, if you start, if you, it's, it's one of the tenets of the free trade that we don't, we don't start meddling in how things are produced in other countries. Mm -hmm. But you know, we can change that. But it, it seems to me that it's more, it's, it's it's a more informationally economizing to tax the pollution where it's generated. Much the same way that gasoline is better taxed uh, when it's refined than having a tax collection system at each at each gas pump. And uh, so I, I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with what's being proposed. It's just that it's not it's not clear to me what I think I think. I'm confused now what the problem is we're trying to solve. <laughs> no, the problem with leakage is basically the problem that you cannot, that you are hurting domestic industries that are suffering from the competition <coughs> of untaxed output of foreign producers. That's if it's a national bill. Excuse me? That, that's if it's nationalist. But the California one, this is the, the issue, the California one, is that you worry about substitutes being produced now in Nevada or well, Oregon or Washington? Matter. So yeah, there's outside leakage. of jurisdiction. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. I, th I think the, I think to answer your question, Michael, you'd have to ask. Uh, you know, if I just tax the um, sales of, uh, of goods in California based on the carbon content in manufacturing, what in fact am I? going to end up with? Is it going to be anything that resembles a, uh, a, a tax on, the, on carbon itself? Or is it, is it going to be, uh, is, it, is it going to have very little resemblance to what a tax on carbon would look like because of the issues we've talked about already? The exports are exempted. Sent outside the state, and the, and the imports are covered if they're used in the state. So I'm not sure. I, I'd have to think about what what problem that would. I think it's a different problem, but I can't put my finger on it. Okay. Well, we can talk about it. Yes, later. we have an hour to get. Yeah. <laughs> unusual. But just getting back to to Michael's point in part. Thing that the other thing you'd have to deal with in, in these uh, the leakage thing, because the leakage issue, you, you have different instruments that you could use across, against other countries than you would across states. So what you can do across states, because of Interstate uh, Commerce Act uh, and the Constitution about, going way back, about tariff uh, on, on uh, goods, it seems that you've got fewer instruments to use with leakage across states than you do uh, leakage internationally. And then for, for countries like the U.S., where we've got a huge domestic market and lots of uh, producers and relative mobility of, of capital and firms for all kinds of reasons, uh, compared to... So if we compare... California to you know, the Netherlands or the Czech Republic or something. So, so those countries at least may have more instruments to use across countries than, but I don't know, than it's EU restrictions and, and so on about differential. But, but across states, we've got very little that you can do that's, that's constitutional. 
protecting, which is one reason I think Michael proposed. One yeah, that's what I mean. So yeah. Michael's would, because that, that, again, that's what I was getting at about this um, singling out principle that you can't have, uh, which would be true if you were taxing differentially across states. Except what I said, it doesn't, so it doesn't single anything out. No, it doesn't. Yeah, no, yours is fine. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. 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 Yours would satisfy that. Now, the Waxman-Markey bill, uh, had a clause in there that allowed the, uh, the U.S. government to put a countervailing tariff on a country's uh, imports, the imports into the U.S., mm. uh, based on carbon content, but only if the other country didn't have its own um, oh, right. regulation of carbon. That ended up being one of the most controversial parts of the bill, and I think was one of the things that uh, threatened to, uh, or could have caused its demise in the Senate. Really? Yeah. Oh. I mean, it, it, it's a 2,000-page bill, which few people read, but the, the one thing that uh, that really didn't stick out and get a lot of press coverage anyway was this ability the president to slap on a countervailing tariff. That's unlikely. 35% tariff. Nowadays, proposing now. <laughs> nowadays, it wouldn't uh, raise any eyebrows. <laughs> Eric, can we go back to the, the question of the um, output of the tradable permits going into current industries, the grandfather clause sort of thing? Right. That wouldn't be quite like um, uh, your output subsidy because it would. Um, Minimize the wealth transfer from the existing industries, but they were just they would contract just as much. <clears throat> that is, they get their um, their uh, tradable permits. They sell most of them because um, they don't need them as much as, as others, and their industry would contract. They get the same dead weight loss then. But I'm just saying that's politically going to be easier because now they uh, they're sharing the. You know, there's, there's a lot of questions in, your, in that quick, short question. Yeah, it's more like a discussion. Uh, talk about this. Uh, the, the, a lot of the papers on this issue talk about a continuum uh, where the permits are freely allocated, the grand, grandfather basically has one extreme, and the other extreme is where everything's auctioned. And in the middle, where you have a uh, output allocation where you give uh, where it's sort of like grandfathering except it's not 100% grandfathering and it's based on your output and pe people try to distinguish among those but even grandfathering is not uh, quite clear it, you, you're suggesting in your in your question that there's uh, exit from the industry you know they take their grandfathered permits sell them and <coughs> exit the well, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the grandfathered mechanisms, well, first of all, they're operating in a dynamic context, and often they don't allow you to keep getting your grandfathered permits if you've exited. So that's basically a, sub a subsidy to uh, staying, uh, basically lowers your average costs. Mm -hmm. So uh, would not have that effect. Would, would actually more serve as a barrier to entry new firms that don't have those grandfather permits. So even that the grandfather thing is, has, has many, you can describe it in many different ways, uh, as to how to design it in many different ways, which, which would have very significant exit and entry incentives associated, different exit and entry aspects associated with it. But the the output subsidy is usually often described as a way of handling this dynamic issue. That if you if you put in a tradable permit system and you cause a shift in industry, some industries rise and some industries fall. You don't continue to give them the same uh, allocation based on their historic production. But you rather 
give them an allocation based on their output or maybe their emissions output ratio. So if you're a smaller industry, you're going to get a smaller grandfather allocation in the next period. So the, the, the bottom line here is that there are, there are um, a lot of ways of adjusting the, the subsidy to that, that firms get, either through grandfathering or partial grandfathering. And uh, one, I, I, one of the, the, the two concerns people have are the, the windfall that the, the companies get, and secondly, the, uh, um, the entry disincentives provided by keeping the, uh, by, by keeping old firms active, and uh, um, both of those are addressed in part anyway with an output subsidy, but, but it's a real that's that's a, the political economy is that if you grandfather these things, everybody's in favor of it. All <laughs> firms, <laughs> right. uh, and and you really want to find a, find a sweet spot where you and the tax every or auctioning off permits they're all opposed to. So you want a sweet spot that's in between where you can um, accomplish what you need to accomplish. Dean and I are both on this point. Go ahead. I want to defend grandfather here more generally. I mean, if you think of this, because this this is a I think something that comes up in all sorts of natural resource stuff. Yeah. If you think of the original problem as open access and the existing users are, are there basically uh, uh, claiming uh, some of the access, whether it's a fishery or, or an atmosphere, what have you. And the new policy is viewed as closing the open access. Um, you need some, if you think of it kind of as contracting if you will, you need some gain from uh, enclosing the open access resource. These these guys who, who are there already claiming they've, they've invested in the resource and they're likely to be supportive of enclosing the resource and generating some rents. Um, and so the one thing that gets lost in this discussion, you think about carbon taxes as a deadweight loss, they're in fact, if they're done right, or fish quotas if they're done right, they're not a deadweight loss. They are capturing the rent from the open access resource. So there is no deadweight loss from the carbon tax, actually, if it's the right carbon tax. It's, it's mitigating the open access rent dissipation. Um, the guys who, so you can think of the, the existing users as people who have claims on the resource that have some value. They've invested in specific assets, probably, uh, and so forth. And by, de by because of that, they're politically inclined uh, to uh, to favor something where they would, you know, get some return on this through the regulatory process. And I think it's a, it's a way that people don't think about it typically because economists love this idea of auctioning stuff off uh, to give it to the greater uh, society, so to speak. That tends to go uh, nowhere, usually. Fisheries, ITQs, and all these fisheries quotas tend to be uh, uh, effective when they basically uh, reward the existing users. You can call it grandfathering or a giveaway if you like, but I think it's a little bit of a misleading way to think about it. Yeah, let me just follow up. My, mine's a different point, I think, which is your point about entry. Um, so it, it does deter entry to a certain extent, but it doesn't. You, you want resources in their highest value use. That's easy. So if you get grandfathered, but you don't, you're lousy at running your firm. I can still have the incentive to buy out your firm. I've got to pay you for the fact that you've got these grandfathered permits as opposed to had we auctioned them off, I'd have been better off because I could outcompete you for those. But you you smooth, as you said, everybody goes for it. You smooth the political problem, and you don't prohibit entry. It just it slightly raises the cost, but it's still like any merger and acquisitions. You, you still have that resources still we should move to the most efficient uh, uh, producer if you if you grandfather. I, think. Um, I, I had one follow up just. To, I want to follow up on these two. Things. Yeah, please. <laughs> I mean, I think en entry is, is is complicated because yeah. uh, firms, if they have market power, incumbent firms and market power. Oh yeah, this, right. This can, they, yes, this can help. Fair if, they're, if they're in a competitive environment, then you're right. Yeah, fair uh, enough. The competitive environment will cause them to uh, uh, yeah. to, to 
cost economize. But uh, Dean's, Dean's point is a really good one. There's, there's a paper that Larry Goulder did a few years ago looking at the minimum fraction of permits that needed to be given away to make the incumbents whole. Basically, mm -hmm. uh, we all agree that if you give them all these permits, uh, they're, they're no worse off than, than before. Uh, but if you, only, if you give them half of them, for instance, they may also be, be uh, better off than so that maybe there's a, there's there's a sweet spot where uh, you actually compensate them for their property right by giving them a certain amount of permits, but you don't overcompensate them for their property right. Is it blocked entry? Is that the what's that? That is how can they be better off with just fifty percent? Well, because because after af, you'd look at after the permit system is is in place and the cost of of actually. Their cost is the, the cost of reducing their emissions. Uh, that whatever that cost is is equal in value to the free permits that the value of the free permits they get. Eric, they don't they don't have to be given. It works because of increasing marginal costs of abatement. So if you have some cheap opportunities, then what you have to look at is the total cost of abatement under the abatement cost rate. And if if and and you can get. Allowances. If you only get half of your allowances, you you may actually break even in terms of total costs. Better description. <laughs> Charlie, you always get the last word. I don't have any more words, but that's a, it's a great discussion. I, I really really appreciate it. And if anybody has any uh, individual comments, feel free to email me or additional individual. And I got my notes here. I really appreciate it. Great discussion. Great. Thanks, Charlie.